Welcome to Health Oddity, the show that strips away the jargon and hype surrounding all things health and fitness to help you live a long, strong and energetic life. Lining up at the bar this week, here's Peter Lant, Paul Bassett and James St. Pierre. Hello and welcome to the Health Oddity podcast episode 19. This is the very first episode of 2021 and what a year it is going to be it's going to be much better than 2020 i'm sure and we're actually recording this on new year's eve uh 2020 so uh and we have a very special guest with us today um a strength and conditioning coach personal trainer an all-round uh good person to know val craft so i met val um, a few months ago, we connected via social media and, uh, and we had a bit of a chat and we found out that we've got some uh, mutual, uh, mutual mentors, mutual friends within the industry, uh, one of them being uh, Mr. Dan John uh, from the USA. Um, and we connected and we, we had a good chat. And then Val kind of afterwards, we, we had a chat about potentially her coming on the podcast. She's got some really interesting uh, topics for us to discuss that are not like anything that we have uh, touched on the podcast before and the fact that we're recording this on New Year's Eve and we're going into a new year and uh, we've mentioned lots before about reflecting and reviewing and uh, being a bit more mindful as we move forward so I thought it would be a great opportunity uh, to get Val on but first thing I'm going to do is just introduce and welcome our usual uh, hosts Mr Peter Lance say hello Peter Hello, how are we doing? Happy New Year for last week. <laughs> Happy New Year, we should say, yes. And uh, hello, Mr. Paul Bassett. Hello, Happy New Year. <laughs> if you are watching... Like you mean it. <laughs> if you are watching on YouTube, you will see that Paul is clutching desperately to the final moments of festivities and he is wearing a Christmas jumper, so... Uh, I've spent about five quid on this jumper from Asda, so, you know, I want to get... That's some wear and tear out of it. It'll probably only last till the end of the week. <laughs> okay. That's, that's and, optimistic, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, I'm going to uh, say welcome, and uh, it's an honour to have you on, uh, Valcraft. Hiya. Yeah, so uh, thank you for um, letting me come on and um, talk about, I think, quite, uh, like you said, for you guys, maybe quite an interesting subject that I think... I think over time now, we'll start to develop more conversations like this going forward. I think it's quite a big topic at the moment, personally, but yeah. Excellent. We won't give away what the topic is yet, because that's going to keep our listeners uh, glued, to the, uh, glued to the podcast. Um, but first of all, Val, maybe you can just sort of explain to people who maybe, uh, you know, don't know you or haven't met you before, um, just a little bit about yourself and uh, what you do, where you are, and kind of how you got to where you are today. And then we'll move into kind of the, the, the real topic that we're here to discuss today. Yeah, no problem. Um, so for me, coming into kind of fitness, that kind of background, um, I was somebody that was always fit and active growing up. Um, it started with swimming when we were kids. My parents were quite keen on making sure that we could swim, which I, I, I very much value my parents for valuing that for us. Um, so that was great. Um, and then I've done a whole bunch of sports kind of growing up uh, and, and just always been active, like karate, uh, football, ice hockey. Um, and snowboarding, I, I got really into snowboarding um, a few years back uh, and became a snowboard instructor. And I also used to do some freestyle coaching, predominantly in this country, for a couple of um, a couple of the no well-known freestyle snowboarding companies here in the UK. Um, I became a fitness instructor back in 2000. I I didn't know what I wanted to do when I left school, and I, I did an engineering apprenticeship, oddly <laughs> enough. Um, but unfortunately, at that time, especially in this area, um, a lot of the companies were um, outsourcing stuff to places like Malaysia and they, they, they couldn't afford to take me on at the end of the apprenticeship. Um, and I'd just taken a part time job at a local leisure centre um, and absolutely loved it. Um, and from that, that's when I'd, I'd already been training in a gym myself, a local community centre gym since about the age of 16. And so then when I was 20 and I got this job at the local leisure centre, 
um, the gym was kind of a place that I was kind of drawn to. Um, and so I actually put myself through my fitness instructor certificate rather than waiting for the council to pay to put me on it because um, it was a council run facility. Um, and I absolutely loved it. Um, I think the only thing for me at that point in time is I, I, I didn't see a long future in it at that point in time. Um, and I also decided to go away traveling um, and get some life experience because at the same time I was also doing some volunteer youth work. Um, really, really enjoyed doing youth work. And, but again, at that point in my early twenties, I felt like I didn't have enough life experience to, to offer other people. Um, and so I went away traveling and I lived overseas for, for two and a half years. Um, uh, I did a little bit of traveling in Australia and then lived in New Zealand for just over two years, which was a fantastic experience. Um, when I came back to the UK, um, I, I again kind of worked in leisure um, and still wasn't really convinced on where I could go long term with that. And I felt like at that point in time, personal training was something that people were giving you the money and expecting some sort of magic to happen without putting in any effort. Um, and so I got very frustrated with it. Um, and I ended up going into youth work at that point in time. So I became a, a professionally qualified youth worker. The government at that point made it a degree profession. So I, I did my undergraduate degree um, and I worked in youth and community work for 10 years. On the side of that, I was still doing bits of sports coaching, in particular, the snowboarding was a big thing through that time. Um, and towards the end of that, I, I decided with the way that things had gone kind of government wise in this country that actually I didn't want to stay employed in youth and community work. And actually, I saw kind of an opening to use fitness as a tool to work with people more broadly than just fitness. Um, now, interestingly, I, I ended up going off and, and finding CrossFit at the end of my snowboarding. Uh, at the end of that kind of time, I decided heading towards my fort is that throwing myself off big lumps of snow and metal boxes was probably not the best idea. Um, so I decided to step back away from that and found CrossFit. Um, and what I found was I was really interested in how when I went back to do some snowboarding, how it had impacted my snowboarding, how all that fitness and the strength that I developed had actually improved my performance in, in sport. And that's where my interest in strength and conditioning came in. And I was so interested that I couldn't believe all this knowledge is out there around strength and conditioning. But regular Joes like me, you never get to hear this information. Um, so I decided to study strength and conditioning and use that as, as part of the tool to work with people more broadly. Um, and so I offer, I offer strength and conditioning for anybody that is, is a recreational athlete that, that wants to improve in their sport. But I also um, do kind of more generic uh, personal training, but helping people um, kind of enjoy sports and being active rather than just going and moving for an hour somewhere. And this whole concept of uh, move more, eat less, actually like trying to take that further and give people something that they can enjoy, that they can see a development and a progress in that. Because I think if you can see development and progress physically, I think mentally it crosses over. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I really wanted to kind of develop that area of my, of my work. Um, and so the subject that we're going to come on to today, that's, an, that's one area in particular that I'm really keen to help people with and also use um, sports and fitness and strength and conditioning principles really to encourage people into, into positive behaviours, positive um, activities that I think also help develop positive attributes of your mind. Um, I, I think developing the two, I think mind and body, I don't think you can neatly separate them. And I know definitely for me, developing physically and having sports in my life definitely helps keep me on an even keel mentally. That's fantastic. And um, so it's actually been a, a kind of a 20 year, 20 year journey for you, hasn't <laughs> it really, to get to where you are and you've kind of meandered and, and deviated and come back and, and, and you know, so, so it's, it's fascinating and, and fantastic to talk to people. I mean, you sat, you, we, I think we spent, we said when we spoke uh, a few, uh, maybe a, I think it was about a month ago or so now that we've kind of had a similar um, upbringing, if you like, in the leisure industry. You know, I've worked in leisure centers and council run places, you know, and, and you see the, and, and back then, obviously personal training as a concept really didn't exist, did it? It wasn't, it was something that was very fresh and it was seen as something that 
Hollywood movie stars did, and and it wasn't really something that was that was out there in this country, certainly. Um, so no, that's fantastic. And the the subject you're going to talk to us about today um, is is, uh, is broadly is kind of alcohol and uh, relationships with alcohol and the way maybe as a society we. Uh, the, uh, society's view on alcohol, I suppose, and the, and the way that, that 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 kind of deals with things. So, do you want to kind of maybe touch on? Um, I know some of it's very per quite personal as well, where it's come from. So, obviously, you know, just what you feel comfortable sharing, and and but 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 why this is something that's so important to you, and that you that you want to share with people. Yeah, no worries. So, interestingly. My, my youth work journey actually started, um, one of the youth projects that I was a member of, um, one of the youth leaders said to me, I think you'd be a great youth worker. Do you want to come and volunteer and do some mentoring on this other project that I work for? And I was like, yeah, sure. Um, and that project was called the Young Persons Alcohol Project. And it was a project set up to support young people who were struggling with using alcohol. Um, and it was for 16 to 25 year olds, but predominantly kind of the lower end of that, that age range. Um, so interestingly, I started off at that point. I myself was never a big fan of alcohol. I, it was it was never a taboo subject in our house, um, but my parents didn't openly drink a lot in front of us. Like my mum's never really drunk that much. Um, so I had very little understanding, I would say, of alcohol at that point. But I thought mentoring some of the young people would be great. Um, so, so I did that. So I had, I had quite a bit of education. We, we did um, a training course uh, and we had a residential weekend within that learning about alcohol. And I thought it was, it was really interesting, actually. In the UK here in particular, our thoughts and our culture around alcohol are quite interesting. If you think of the, uh, the key soap operas in this country, what do they base themselves around? Oh, it's a pub. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, I think it's I think it's really interesting. And I know um, we so we kind of looked at that and we looked at like cultural stuff. And this is this is back. So this was back in the late 90s. We were looking at this, but I think it's still very true now. If you look at current popular culture programs, the reality TV shows, you can you can pick any one of the names of the top reality TV shows and look at how much of a key feature alcohol is. Um, and I think this societally ingrained drinking culture is, is there for us. Um, now, for me, I, I, I grew up late teens, early 20s when, it, it, I mean, I, you know, I experimented with alcohol. I'm no different to anybody else. It's just something that I was never really all that enamored with, I think. Um, I don't really like the feeling of being drunk and I definitely don't like the feeling of being hungover. Now, unfortunately, I had some quite deep emotional issues um, that have meant that I've struggled with sleep anxiety. Um, now, one of the things that one of the kind of cultural things that we've got is one, we've got the side of like alcohol. We need it for social interaction and good social interaction. We can't possibly have great social interaction without alcohol, which is absolute rubbish if you break that down. But the other side of it is if we're stressed, let's have some alcohol. Um, and that kind of goes a bit further. Like I had heard people say, oh, no, just have a little drink before you go to sleep. That'll help you get off to sleep. And so I initially when I when I started having real trouble with with sleep anxiety, using a small amounts of alcohol just to get me off to sleep, which magically it does work. Like if you have a little bit of alcohol, that first bit of getting off to sleep, off you go. Um, but over a, an extended period of time, that turned into that I became dependent on alcohol. Now, I think one of the problems we've got is, is the term alcoholism. And for me, what I would like to see and what I'm doing with the blog that I've got around this at the moment, um, and I'm in the middle of writing a book as well, is trying to put out there that we need a wider range of vocabulary and understanding of problems related to alcohol. Because quite often what we think of is when we think of the term alcoholism or somebody that's got a problem with alcohol, we think of somebody maybe in a park on a park bench with a paper brown paper bag with high strength alcoholic drink inside um, and they're getting drunk from <laughs> dawn till dusk, basically. And it's and it's not the case. I think, um, you know, I, I, I did definitely become dependent on alcohol, but that wasn't I didn't need a drink to get up in the morning. You know, I, I have always 
trying to create a life that I love and enjoy. And I can wholeheartedly put my hand on my heart and say, I love my life. It's brilliant. The emotional issues that I've had to work through and I'm still working through now, um, you know, everybody has stuff going on and life isn't easy. But I think if you use those experiences to drive yourself forward and to grow and develop, actually you can turn those negatives into a positive. Um, and that doesn't come from a place of I've had like the most wonderful, lovely life ever without any issues. You know, I've created a life that I love and I'm very lucky to have a mother who loves me unconditionally, which has definitely helped me have the perspective I've got. Um, but I think in any negative, you can turn it into a positive. Um, that said, obviously, I got into this pattern of using alcohol at night to sleep. And that's where it was kind of really focused and concentrated. So most people that knew me whilst I was in this really difficult period with this wouldn't have even known that I really drank alcohol because I was never a big drinker. For me, going to the pub and socialising, I don't need a drink to go and do that. The pub isn't a trigger for me. The trigger was anxiety around sleeping at night and needing something that I knew that would get me off to sleep. Now, the irony of this is that um, most of us that have had a little bit too much alcohol and have tried to go to sleep, we probably pass out to start with. And then most of us will have probably experienced where we wake up in the middle of, middle of the night or the early hours of the morning, restless and all of those uh, feelings that come with um, hangovers, etc., start to kick in. And actually, we don't generally have the best sleep when we are drinking alcohol. Now, this leads me on to... Um, the reason that it's really important for me to speak out on this subject is because I, I don't think we talk enough about the dangers of alcohol as a substance. And I come from the perspective of I don't mind if other people drink around me. What I what I would like to see is that people are more mindful of their drinking and more mindful of alcohol as a substance and what it actually is and does. Um, there's a book by uh, uh, Professor David Nutt. He was the um, government advisor on drugs and alcohol. And a few years back, he he wrote a paper basically talking about alcohol and how if it were a drug found today, it would be a class A drug because of all of the social issues, as well as the addictive properties. It's right up there. Like it's not the best substance for us humans. Um, unfortunately, that wasn't a popular opinion. Um, and he he unfortunately was kind of asked to go, but he's written this book on it. Um, and I quite like his perspective. Now, interestingly, ironically, he also owns a wine bar. Um, but he's... <laughs> I, I was reading that and I thought this is really interesting. But I think this leads to the point of if you haven't gone to the point that I have, and I, I will speak about this in a minute. I think being mindful about your drinking and being aware of what alcohol is and can do is really, really important. And I think educating yourself and having more education out there on the dangers of alcohol is really, really important. I think when we think about the notion of alcoholism, we just assume that it's somebody that's got a problem. They're, 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 they're allergic to alcohol and only alcoholics can ever have a problem. And this just isn't the case. Um, alcohol is a very addictive substance um, and it's also quite harmful to the body. If we think about how um, if you consume too much, most of us will have experienced the hangover. I don't know of any other thing that we consume that regularly makes us ill if we over consume it that we continue to consume. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's weird. It is weird. It is weird. It is weird. Um, but this is this is how it works and this is how it operates and this is this is why i think understanding what alcohol, alcohol is and how it works is really important because it 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 triggers our reward and pleasure center in the brain and this is why even though you can have had the nastiest hangover how many of you have had like the nastiest hangover and sworn blind in that day that you are never drinking again like most people have experienced that, right? If you've, if you've been drinking. Um, but next week or two weeks later and your friends ask you out to the pub for a few pints and a good night out and there you are drinking again. And it's because of the way that your brain, the, most of the time the brain is trying to avoid horrible, nasty experiences. However, when the reward and pleasure circuitry of the brain is engaged, 
it wants that pleasure and alcohol gives us that it, it excites the brain it gives us that feel good feeling and this is where when something's not right if you've got some sort of underlying emotional issue and it doesn't need to be as deep as things that i've gone through um it can be fairly surface level but if you are then using alcohol to mask these things that pleasure and reward circuitry kicks in and you need more and more alcohol and you rely on it become dependent on it and hey presto you will have a problem um and you don't need to be a defective human for that to happen all you need is some sort of emotional upset or something that has triggered you to want to to drink and drink on a regular basis and then begin to consume more and that addictive property the way that that circuitry works in the brain and it's got you in now i just said earlier that i was going to get to this next bit um it's interesting there was a point in in the time that i was using alcohol to go to sleep where it changed for me there, there would have been a point before this particular point in time where i could definitely have still left alcohol and not been dependent on it but there was a point at which it changed um, and I actually did have have a relapse which I think was a good thing when I initially started giving up alcohol um, I went for about 19 months um, and then <clears throat> due to some upset I, I ended up having a relapse which I think was a good thing because after 19 months I still then when I relapsed when I drank alcohol that's that's still the that feeling of dependency was still there even after that amount of time dry and i think if you if you reach a particular point with your drinking it is a point that you can't come back from i think and so i remember being younger and listening to people like robbie williams when i was growing up going through rehab and saying oh i'll never be able to drink again and i didn't really understand that and the youth project that i worked at when i was younger the, the first one they took the approach of that you can relearn healthy drinking and I disagree I think if you hit the point that I got to which I think quite a few people do I don't think you can I think you then have to abstain if you haven't got to that point I think that you can put in place healthy drinking habits and as long as you're aware of the uh, the dangers of alcohol in terms of what it does to your health as well as how addictive it is and where it could lead if it goes goes wrong at some point i think you can drink sensibly and enjoy alcohol um, but i think that you need to i think people need more awareness of this because if you have that thing that tips you over and you go past that point you won't then be able to enjoy alcohol in the same way ever again and that's that's my honest belief and from my experience, uh, that's kind of how it's it's played out. Reading other people's stories, I, you know, I, I hear the same thing from other people who've experienced these issues with alcohol as well. We talked about this a little bit, didn't we, on last week's um, podcast with you, Peter? With, yeah, uh, yeah. With uh, that's why I was looking when you said um, when you said Val was coming on as a guest and and what she was going to talk about. I was like, this is going to be really interesting because it'll have been me as well. <laughs> I, th I think we because i think we there's there, there's like, like you've like you've touched on val i think there's a there's almost like a kind of of a a flippant kind of jokey attitude certainly in this country towards alcohol that there aren't to other sort of substance abuse type you know like, like drugs and, and things like that you know we kind of we, we kind of have a bit of a laugh at that you know you know, someone gets drunk at a party or a family wedding, or there's someone in the family who drinks too much, or, you know, it's kind of a bit of a, it's used a lot in comedy, isn't it, as well? It's kind of a very, like you say, it's kind of an accepted, um, you know, form of, of substance abuse in our in our society. And, and I think the Brits, uh, you know, I think certain people kind of play up to that and, and live up to that and like that kind of image of you know going out and getting drunk and and all the rest of it and it's it's uh it's and I think it's we're brought up certainly as young men I think in this country I can't talk for for, for for women but as young men growing up it's very much you know you start drinking you know when you're when you're 16 17 18 you start going down the pub and it's kind of just it, it, it's kind of an accepted route in and um yeah i don't know what you feel uh 
Paul, if you've, if you, you know, how you've felt about what Val said so far. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, I mean, we all, we probably all experience, I mean, I, I work in London and London's a very high pressure place. You know, there's a lot of competition in terms of jobs. There's a lot of competition in terms of the kind of characters, you know, people are attracted from all around the world to, to come to London to, to succeed. And it's a very high pressure environment. And, um, and a lot of the time alcohol is part of the, the valve that releases pressure for, I mean, I've had clients, I don't have any clients at the moment like this, but I've had clients in the past who would drink quite happily a bottle of wine at lunch routinely every day. I had in the past clients who'd turn up a bit drunk, um, you know, from big nights out and you'd have to send them home. Um, and these were respectable people. It's just they had so much pressure in their life. Um, and I, I've, I've never been, I've never counted myself as an addictive person, but I have, I mean, if I look back versus my lifestyle now, it's not, I'm like a Puritan or anything. It's just, I can't drink in any way like I used to, because the next day I'm up at five in the morning or four in the morning and uh, I'm taking classes until the evening and I'm training and, and I've got kids and it, I just can't, I physically, I've tried it. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> I had a go. I I it for a stick, but it just didn't work. <laughs> you just can't do it. And in the end, you know, you could do it for a few weeks and then you just, collapse and, I, and I, i'm not i'm not prepared. i think i think the thing i've picked up on from what val's just said is like because you know i've had um I, I, i've known people who are alcoholics i was probably uh not an alcoholic but like a functioning you know i could function with or like after a big night out and getting a few hours sleep and all that and there'll be plenty of people who can do that like like val said who don't even know people like They'll think, oh, they just drink a bit. They won't even know they've got a drink problem. They'll probably just think they're quite sociable. I knew I knew lots of people like that. And I was a bit like that as well. There was one guy who I knew in particular years ago. And he was out every single night. And we all used to drink quite a lot. But this one guy, it was like, you, you need to calm down. And he was like, what are you talking about? I'm not doing anything different to you lot. And it was like, right, you were out on Monday night. He was like, yeah, but I was out with this guy. And it was like, right, you were out on Tuesday night. Yeah, but so was this guy, different guy. So... He was out every single night. He was the constant. He'd be out on Monday night with two, two of his mates, Tuesday night with me and another mate, maybe. It's Wednesday night with another two mates. So he thought everyone was out all the time. And it was like, no, it's just you. Everyone else is out like once during the week and then a bit at the weekend. You're out seven nights a week. And he didn't well, realize. to me because I was in, on tour all the time. Yeah. And he, <laughs> but he didn't realize. He was like, I'm just doing what everyone else does. And it was like, because there's peer pressure obviously there and all of that. Like all of this stuff comes under it. But um, he thought everyone was doing the same. And it was like, no, you've, you, you really need to sort yourself out because it's every single day. Yeah, that's it's it. Quite scary. I mean, I worked with musicians and they'd have this massive high after playing a show, they had no responsibilities. They'd have a tour manager who would do everything for them. They didn't have to drive or anything. And then they get off the stage, they'd have this huge adrenaline dump. And then they'd have like till three in the morning where they didn't have to do anything. They'd have a rider. They'd have people who came up to the movie drinking and everything. And then every night was like that, every night. I mean, I ended up collapsing in the street when I was like 28 in Manchester after a gig and I just had a pint because I, I spent so many years just like having two or three pints every night, even more than eating crap in the evening, smoking loads of cigarettes and my body just gave way. And that was for me a big thing. But for a lot of people, it never comes to that. They never have the health event that, that, that tells them to just Well, they do, out. but not, not as early as 28. Everyone's got, you can't yeah. drink that much and not have a health, health event. It's like what you said last week. And I, I, I've recently said it to some of my clients is like the, the pain of where you are at the moment has to be worse than the pain of changing. Absolutely. You know, and, and that was some for me, and I'm not sure it was for you, Val. You know, there must have been some point in which you went, well, hang on a minute, what's happening here? And there's a, there's a snap, and you have to make a decision. And it, it's, you know, it's not an instantaneous solution, but the, the, a decision is made. Was it a quick decision or was it a slow one? I mean, um, I, it, it was quite hard because it, it kind of crept up, really. Like, to start with, I, I know that I, I just, I just, kept maintaining that my issue was with sleep and it wasn't with alcohol um, and like I say there was that there was this definite point at which it switched over where I where I know that I wouldn't I, I, I no longer have control so if I had a drink in the evening that could or could not stop at one drink or continue on to more um, and at the point where that switched um, 
it was after that then then it kind of dawned on me that actually my problem wasn't the sleep anxiety anymore the problem was I now I've got a, dr a drink problem so it was it was <laughs> It was a long time before that realization or knowing that alcohol, I, th I think because it's so widely accepted in our culture and stress is one of the areas that people, like you said, like people in London, we use it as a de-stress. Like how many people do that and have like a glass of wine or a couple of glasses of wine on a night when they've had a, a you know a tough day or whatever at the end of the week or whatever it is. And it's so ingrained in our culture that we can use it to de-stress in that way that it, it was hard to see that there was a problem building um, but at that point, once it had switched and I realized that actually I'm, I'm no longer in control of this now, it took a really long time. And this is one of the reasons that I wanted as well to, to talk about my issue is because it wasn't like I could then just stop. It took a lot of time. And I think this is one of the things like people are like, oh, you just need to employ more willpower. Now, another book I really recommend, so so um, Professor David Nutt, his book, Drink, question mark, I recommend anybody, no matter how much you drink, go and read this book. Chapter two is a very sobering experience. It gives you all of the health information about alcohol and it will make you really question it going forward. Um, uh, but another one is The Chimp Paradox. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I really like that in terms of understanding how the brain works. And if you if you then kind of transpose that to, to a problem like being dependent on alcohol, it makes so much so much sense. And the reason that you can't you can't just employ more will, willpower to give up that pleasure reward circuitry in the brain, um, the, the strength of our emotional mind versus the cognitive mind. And it's a very hard game to kind of play and try and get out of. Mm. Um, now, I also experienced quite quite a difficult time reaching out to professional services. Um, one of the services that I, I, I reached out to, um, I was kind of laughed at by a couple of people from that organization because I wasn't at rock bottom. I wasn't <laughs> I wasn't a bum in a part. You know, I had a partner. We lived in a house. I had a day job. For the most part, for most of the day, I was sober. It was only at night time to use alcohol to get to sleep where my problem was. Most people who knew me wouldn't have known that I had a problem even. And so then to people that had hit a much further rock bottom than I had done, that kind of seemed a little bit ridiculous. So that was quite hard. And I um, uh, then I, I reached out to the local drug and alcohol service. And the first appointment I had was brilliant and the woman was great. But then again, because my, my problem was was not as great and my need wasn't as great seemingly as other people's I was on a waiting for, list for for a really long period of time you know and I, I tried so many different ways to try and tackle this problem um, and, and what it was for me there were a few kind of key things which is why I, I wanted to talk about it because I know there'll be other people who aren't at that kind of real hard deep end of, of having an issue with alcohol who will also find difficulties like I did in trying to get help and trying to trying to get help to stop or trying to stop by themselves um, and I think one of the really key ones and I think this this transposes across into to personal training anybody with weight loss issues etc is it's accountability um, I opened up to a group of friends um, and uh, because at that time I, I was I was going to CrossFit we were there most days of the week it was a group that then I saw on a daily basis and feeling like I was accountable to them to them they probably it probably meant not so much to them they probably didn't you know it probably didn't matter to them whether I did or didn't drink um, but it was it was me it was my own internal um, thing that I felt then accountable to them and because I saw them on a regular basis um, that was one of the things that that really really helped me I think reading on the subject was really, really helpful as well. Um, and Annie Grace's book, um, This Naked Mind, was really good. And she talks about liminal thinking to try and help overcome the, the emotional mind, which is a little bit stronger than our cognitive mind. Um, and that was that was a really useful book to, to help me through. Um, and fitness, like having something that I really enjoyed, like... Um, and I mean, I competed at quite a low level in CrossFit style competitions, but still, you know, I, I really enjoyed that. And I and I figured out, you know, I can't wake up feeling the effects of alcohol and feeling a bit hungover if I want to do this, if I want to get stronger, if I want to get fitter. 
it was a bit different to when I'd been snowboarding because snowboarding culture, again, alcohol is a big thing within that. Health and fitness, strength and conditioning at that point in time wasn't really something on people's minds or the agenda within that context. Um, so it wasn't really until then, then coming into doing like fitness like that and wanting to compete and do well in things. The first year we did the um, superhuman games in, in Bristol. Um, and this was one of the this was one of the moments I I had real trouble getting to sleep the, the night um, before the superhuman games the first time I competed. Um, and so I'd got up and I'd I'd gone out and I'd gone and I'd gone and found I, I can't remember what I drank that particular night. But anyway, I, I'd, I'd got drunk and I woke up that next morning and luckily somebody else was driving me to the event and because uh, there's no way I could have driven. Um, and I competed at that event. Nobody else knew that I'd been absolutely wasted the night before. Nobody knew that I had a hangover. I was, I, you know, I got very good at hiding these things. And I competed in this event. And lo and behold, my training partner and I at that time then came fifth out of the master's category. So I was like... Well, that's not bad. Imagine what I could do if I actually <laughs> hadn't been drinking the night before. <laughs> and I was like, and it wasn't, it wasn't long after that that I was like, do you know what? Like this, this has got to go. And like health and fitness side of it was definitely one of the things that really, really helped me. Um, so the following, the following year, um, so it, it still took a really long time. So the following year, I I had been about a month. I'd given up alcohol. I I tried in between in that year. I tried. I, I and I, I kind of saw it and like a little bit like learning new skills, like double unders or something. Like when you're learning something like double unders, you you're not going to go unbroken for for the total amount of reps. Actually, you're going to do some where you've got it, and then you might have a little break. Maybe do some single unders, and then you're going to go back to it. And so actually, in that year, there were there were times I was recording. I had a whiteboard. And at the top of the whiteboard, it said she believes she could do it. So she so she did. And so that was one of my my overarching kind of um, mantras. And then on the whiteboard, I would write down like how many days unbroken and how many days broken I'd had without alcohol. So in, in that year and then it wasn't until the May that I, I then I nailed it. So the, the second year that we competed at the Superhuman Games, I, I, I was I hadn't had a drink in like. I think it was like a month three weeks to four weeks something like that uh and it was amazing and so I just went out like gave it everything that I got I'd been training really hard because I felt like I'd let my training partner down the year before because of the alcohol um uh, you know coming coming fifth and I was at the most stinking hangover on a blazing hot day we had the thrusters workout the last workout and I absolutely died in it and on the floor at the end of it and I was like you know I, I let her down because of my issue so I worked bloody hard and we won it the following year. So <laughs> it was all it was all worth it in the end. Um, but I, and that's where I think if if there's something you want to overcome, and it doesn't need to be an alcohol issue, um, I, you know the so sugar and the brain's pleasure reward center very similar, really really similar um, system in play there. Uh, and I think having accountability and then finding something that means that much to you that you want to be able to grow and develop in it and you know actually if you continue with that behavior pattern you're not going to get the results that you want and I think that that really helped me so it wasn't instant it didn't it didn't click in until until it changed for me and then I knew I was in I knew it was like almost being too late you you don't realize until you're in the deep water and then you're like oh man where have I got myself um, but even from then, it took a really long time to actually be able to go unbroken, not drinking, because it's so deeply ingrained in terms of how the, the, the brain's pleasure reward centre works. For me, in terms of trying to access support when, you know, I've got a job, I've got a house, I've got a partner, things on the outside look really rosy. Um, and so I think recognizing this earlier on, and I think having more discussions like this and understanding that, that it's a continuum, it's not just alcoholic here, 
happy and drinking here actually there's a spectrum yeah. all the way along this and i think being mindful it's interesting that you use the word mindful mindfulness is something that i'm really keen on uh, mindfulness and meditation and i think being mindful is really really key and i think knowing how much you're drinking and being accountable to yourself even in regular drinking even if you're just a social drinker on the weekends or whenever you choose to but being aware and being mindful of how much you're drinking i think is really really useful and i think it's I think we should live more mindfully in general. Again, it links back to if you're having issues with food, again, being mindful of what you're eating and when you're eating and what types of food you're eating. Um, and I think educating yourselves on the dangers of alcohol, uh, like I alluded to earlier in the drink book, chapter two, go and read it. Um, but interestingly, like talking about people who drink a bottle of wine in the evening or like are out every single night of the week, um, a bottle and a half of wine per week or seven pints of 3.6 percent alcohol beer or I think it's five uh, five pints of 5.2 percent beer that takes you over the recommended um, limit per week which when you think about it like that isn't a lot it's not a lot, it's not a lot. five to seven pints depending on that's the strength just, that's the starter of a night out like for, for most people isn't it <laughs> that's like the, the, the edge off <laughs> and that's the thing that's the thing you know and um, that drinking culture that we've got and when it's popularized and glamorized in in popular culture and tv shows seeing people drink to excess and drinking more than that actually on one occasion mm. but actually over an entire week that that is deemed the the, the the first level of being unsafe for human health I think if you don't if you don't mind me just just coming in, I think there's a few like everything you've just said there. There's a few things that I got out of it um, that I've I've used and done. So the the first thing was like you said you came fifth in the CrossFit um, games, superhuman games, superhuman games. That was it. And then first when you didn't have any, but that that yeah when you came fifth you were like oh imagine what I could do if I hadn't have been drinking. Which I think a lot of people look at stuff and go well I've been drinking I've got a hangover and I've managed to do that so it's fine. Because I can do yeah. that with a hangover, so why bother? Yeah. You know, that's good enough. So people stick with that, and it's like, no, imagine your potential if if you didn't feel like that all the time. Not giving up totally, obviously, but, like, just taking it a bit more easy and all of that. Um, but the other thing was what you said about trying to get help. So there's this continuum, and you've got a kind of – but, like, obviously, funding and the amount of people who are there to help people – it's it, it's got to be really hard, right? Because it's kind of like saying you've got to hit rock bottom first because they're the people who need to help first. But is it easier, to, is it better to get people before they get there? Do you know what I mean? But it's yeah. harder to do that because you also need to want to change. You can say, right, I want mm -hmm. help. I want to change. But you're going to go and carry on doing the things. So like, actually, some people have got to get a rock bottom first before they can actually say, do you know what? Like what Paul said, the pain of remaining the same is, is bigger than the pain of change. And what I did... So the guys I was talking about earlier, the guys I had spent, I, I don't see any of my university mates anymore because they were all very, like, they're similar to that. The guys who I used to work with, who I was talking about earlier, when I, when I was working, I was living in Swindon, where you are now, and working for a company there. And it was a big culture of that. And I moved to Bath and just got out of it. And they all got really annoyed with me and, and all of that because I basically ditched them all because I was like, I can't cope with this anymore. I can't do it anymore. Mm. Um, and it's, so, so if you're trying to find help professionally, say, which can be tricky and expensive and all of that, it's try and find a group of people who, and we've been talking about values on this and everything, find a group of people who hold the values that, that you want. Mm -hmm. And then you can, you can kind of ingrain yourself within that and they hold you accountable without, and you've just, you said with CrossFit, they were holding you accountable and they didn't even know it because... Yeah. All you did was put yourself in that in that environment, and I think that's massive. Which is what we, I mean, well, I don't I don't know necessarily about you, Val, but we kind of train some groups as well, and and that and that's certainly what I want out of my group. I want them to enjoy turning up, and it holds them accountable. So even when they're going to think about going to do something, they'll think. But like these group of people who I'm with, three hours a week, I need to think about that in the same in the same moment, in a kind of doesn't stop them doing something silly or whatever you want to call it, but it might rein them in a little bit. And another thing that James, I know James does, is he'll buy like two beers. So if you go to the supermarket and buy a crate of beer and go, well, I'll, you know, I might have a couple. 
and then another day I might have a couple. And you're going to get through them very quickly. If you go and buy two, come home, you're going to have two. Mm. And then you're not going to go, you know, it's getting in alcoholic territory, isn't it? When you go, right, I've run out of my crate. I'm going to go and get another one. And then there's a guy who I used to train, uh, the Rugby Tots guy, actually, who I did, I did a podcast with previously or when I was doing them. And he used to, like, he's, he used to drive to the supermarket to go and get more when he was hammered and stuff like yeah, like years ago, he's given it all up now, but like things like that, that's when like, obviously you've got a real problem. But if you just buy, you know, what you want for that, like just limit it and say, right, I'm going to have two tonight and just buy two. And that's yeah. it. It makes well, it a lot easier. Well, that was one of the things. So I, I, I put out on my, um, uh, on my blog, I, I actually did a video one for, for Christmas. And this was one of the things I said to people is, is if you're struggling at the moment, if you're trying to reduce your alcohol or if you want to go teetotal, actually you need to plan for Christmas. You need to plan for social events because it's so ingrained in our culture. You need to know what your what you will what you will accept for yourself. What's your limit that you're going to accept? Are you going to reduce? And is there a limit that you can set yourself that you're like, actually, that's what I deem safe for myself? And if you're going teetotal, obviously that's easy. We know we're not going to drink any alcohol, but then putting in place measures um, so that you know you can keep yourself safe within that. Like this whole thing of just going and buying two beers. If two beers is all you want to have in an evening, great, just buy the two beers. It saves lots of drama and that potential for then going for more. And I think that's a really good point. And like I say, it was it was one of the things that I put out in this in this Christmas one to get people to really think about if there is a time coming up where you know alcohol is going to be around, you need to know how you're going to manage that situation. Um, and I think preparing for that and being prepared for those times is is really key as well to, to succeeding in what you want to achieve. Thanks. Yeah. I think this has been fantastic to actually, because we the, 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 health, the, the health Oddity podcast, uh, as I said, this is episode 19 today. Um, lots of the, the episodes we've focused on or we've talked about kind of training and, 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 and lifestyle and, 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 yeah, values and goals and things like that. But <clears throat> alcohol is such a something that is so ingrained in, in our society. In, in, in certainly, in, we, we have people I know who listen in America and Canada and, and all over, but certainly where we're recording in, in the UK, in England, so ingrained in our society. And it has such a, can have such an impact on, on health, not just not just you know physical health, but mental health and social health, and uh, you know the dynamics of families and everything. Um, so I think it's been fascinating and really good to to talk about it. And um, and yeah, it's been something very very different for us. So I just want to thank you, uh, Val, for for coming on and spending spending time on your New Year's Eve uh, uh, with us. Um, if people want to find out more about uh, you, and you've mentioned your blog a couple of times, um, how can people maybe get in touch with you or read, read, read the kind of stuff you're putting out or follow you? What, what, what's the best way for people to do that? Cool. So if, if you want to have a look specifically alcohol-wise, um, my, my blog is btotal.com. Um, uh, and I also have my my training website, which is bperformance.co.uk. Um, all of my contact details are on there. Uh, and with the blog, you can you can sign up to, to, to get the alerts for for new blogs as they come out. Um, and I do have an accountability program. And for the new year, there will be a, a, a BT Total uh, specific accountability program, because I think the point you raised, raised Peter, about um, accountability is key. So I, I actually I don't necessarily have lots of group programs set up in that way at the moment, but I do have individual programs where people set their own targets and goals. And it, it's an accountability program with me that they have, because I think that's a really, really key thing is feeling accountable to somebody. Um, and it's led and driven by them. But yeah, um, bttotal.com and then also bperformance.co.uk. Um, those are my uh, two websites. So if you want to get in touch, please do. If you've got any comments about anything from today, if you're looking for support for yourself or somebody else, please do get in touch. I'm not a trained counsellor. I do have that youth and community work background. But I do have an emotional therapist and a very well trained and qualified counsellor who I can excuse me, so who I can refer people to. And I do do that. For me, it's about working in tandem with other people. It's not about me working solely with everybody. You know, I don't have all the skills, um, but please do get in touch. Excellent. Um, is there anything you'd like to, uh, to, to, to add or 
or uh, or say Mr. Paul Bassett, or would you like to say uh, Happy New Year? <laughs> yes, with my Christmas jumper on. Uh, no, it was um, yeah, no, it's very fascinating. And uh, as we go into the new year, and a lot of people look to uh, make changes in their lifestyle, it's a it's a timely a subject to have. Um, but I certainly like your point on the fact that it's not just about restriction. It is about find you know if, if alcohol is a, is a is triggered it triggers a reward system within our brain you know um it will become much more difficult to uh to change that signaling if you just focus on restriction and you're not trying to replace it with a, a maybe a new reward and for you it was the crossfit and the competitive element certainly chimes with me you know i got into running and and, and it just it just wasn't compatible you know smoking drinking just wasn't compatible you just can't do one with with both i mean you, you could think you can but you can't um but for but for other people it, 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 having a think about not just cutting things out of their life and saying i'm just going to restrict myself i like the message that you've got to s s seek something more fulfilling because there's obviously something you know we've got to have joy in our life and unfortunately it's, it's misplaced sometimes with alcohol um and there are other ways of triggering those same patterns of joy and and and, and, and interest and you know and de-stress in a much more functional way so it was, it was a really good chat and, and it was lovely to meet you um and for anyone listening you know thanks for listening this year we started the podcast and it's been it's been a really interesting process and uh, it's been great to get to know james and peter really really well uh, and uh, i've learned a lot over the last six months so fantastic Cool. Peter, Lance, anything you'd like to uh, to finish with? Final thoughts? Yeah, yeah, I think this has been great. Like you say, it kind of fits in with last week as well, because I was talking a little bit about this sort of stuff last week. So I think it's been great. So I'll put the links in, Val, for all the stuff you've talked about into the show notes and everything. Um, what I will say is, though, if if you're listening to this and, you know, you've got any questions or anything, because we, 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 we haven't really had any yet. Um, and we do say this every time, you know, give us a like, tell, like, tell your friends if you think you've got friends who um, might have a problem or like not just with alcohol, but with anything, you know, anything that was spoke about. Um, you've got friends that, that might just need a nudge along um, to get into the right groups that they want to like to get the results that they want to get. Just send it their way. Share it like like, it, you know, whatever. Give us a follow. Leave us some reviews and ask questions because. We've got people like Val coming on as guests who know what they're talking about. So if you've got any problems, you can get straight in touch with us, ask the question. And we've got, we've now got this network of people and we're going to get more guests on this year as well. We've got this network of people, like Val said, she hasn't got the skill set for everything. None of us have, but we can start to get to know the people who can help. And then if there's any specific questions, we can be like, right, we'll go and find someone who can answer that. So that's that's what we're after. That's we want to make this as interactive as possible to help as many people as possible. So there we go. And like Paul said, thanks for listening all the way through 2020. Um, we'll continue to listen all the way through the next lockdown, which will go on for to let at least Easter. Let's say we'll talk to you at Easter, um, <laughs> and then you can start going out again and do whatever you like. So, <laughs> but we do appreciate you all, and thanks for listening. Excellent. Thank you very, very much, uh, Val, for joining us today and for, for, for spending your time with us and with our listeners. Um, is there anything you'd like to, to finish on, Val? Um, just no, thank you very much for inviting me on. And I think I think one of the things that this year I think has probably taught a few of us, um, and this is a little bit of a stoic saying, but the obstacle is the way. It, it doesn't matter how difficult a situation is. Actually, growth can co only come out of challenge. You don't grow when you're sat at home being comfy. Um, and so if you see the difficulties that you, you are experiencing in life as an opportunity for growth and development, that takes you into a whole new realm. And I, I promise you, you will enjoy life so much more. So if you are struggling with anything, see this as an opportunity to grow. Find the people that can help you out through this, those that have had experience in that area. Um, and I, I promise you, life will start to look up so much more and it won't matter what challenge comes your way. You will deal with it and, and manage it. Uh, and enjoy life uh, my mantras are live life love life and be the best you excellent thank you so much that's a fantastic way to kick off uh 
2021. So just a quick uh, thank you again from myself to everyone listening. Uh, please do uh, like us, follow us, subscribe to us either on Spotify, on iTunes, on Apple Podcasts, on Google Podcasts. Uh, you can find us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram as well. And uh, we'll see you again very soon. And uh, we look forward to spending 2021 with you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You've been listening to Health Odyssey with Peter Land, Paul Bassett and James St. Pierre. To get your regular fix of hype-free health, you can subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your favourite podcasts. You can find out more on today's and other topics at healthodyssey.com or find us on Facebook or Instagram by searching for Health Odyssey.